Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, and regulatory landscape and capital markets. I'm your host, Joe Malandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ Market Site is John Vonglis, Executive Director of Global Government Affairs at NASDAQ Listed Nano Nuclear Energy, as well as Brian Spencer, Renewables Segment Leader at ABB. And we are here to discuss drivers of the energy transition, driving efficiencies and solutions for grid stability and resilience, and the role of public-private partnerships in infrastructure development. It is great to have the both of you with us, certainly a lot to cover today. John, let's kick it off with you. Give us a brief overview of where Nano sits within the energy space. Well, thank you, Jill. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us, and me in particular. And Brian, it's a pleasure to meet you, too. Uh, so Nano is a vertically integrated microreactor, nuclear microreactor company. Uh, five lines of business, uh, obviously the, the, the design, development, and fabrication of, of microreactors themselves, uh, fuel fabrication, fuel transportation, nuclear fuels obviously, and there's a space component as well as a consulting uh, arm to the company. Uh, so where does it sit? It sits, uh, obviously it's the, you know, it was the, you know, the, the best IPO, in, in small cap IPO in, in 2024. Um, it is certainly not the largest company out there, but I think it's at the cutting edge and forefront of where we're going to be with microreactors. Yeah, well, it has a large demand to fill, that's for sure. Uh, Brian, tell us about ABB. Sure, yeah, ABB is a, a global player uh, in the energy space where we manufacture things like circuit breakers, transformers, um, digital substations that really help power flow from, from where it's being generated to where it's being used. Um, and we're a global company, but do have a focus in the United States where we have 17,000 employees, wow. uh, about 9 billion in revenue. Um, and so the United States is our biggest market and uh, so excited to talk about yeah. transition to so, it. Well, let's talk about that meeting, the, the surging electricity demands. I mean, so much has happened so quickly yes. when it comes to emerging technologies, even if we just isolate the conversation around AI. Sure. There's it, a lot of demand to fill. It really is an incredible time. I was fortunate enough coming up in my career to have found energy early. Um, and I feel like I have a pretty good runway for the rest because there's a, there's a lot that's going to be happening. Um, I just read this morning, I think, actually, that NEMA is expecting demand growth in the United States of 2% per year through 2050. And you'll hear a lot of different statistics. But that's 50% more electricity needed by 2050 than we have today, which is really incredible. And so how are we going to meet that need? It really is going to be kind of all energies to the table uh, and able to do that. Wood McKenzie did an interesting study that I saw at the beginning of this year where they looked at just 2030, where are we going to be to meet the demand of 2030? You take um, the demand growth, you then take out uh, coal retirements that are already planned, you add in natural gas, and there's still a gap of over 100 gigawatts, and that's just 2030. So there's a, it's a tremendous opportunity for uh, the energy industry. It's only less than four years away. Uh, well, it's hard to wrap your head around. It is. Where, where does nuclear sit in the hierarchy of well, energy? Well, to, to, to tack on to, to, you know, to, to continue on, on, on Brian's theme, so demand is growing, and it's growing just by consumer uh, needs, uh, um, electric vehicles, AI, data centers, Bitcoin, the mining that's required, the energy required for all these pursuits is massive, and it's growing probably exponentially. Um, some would argue that we have an abundant sources of energy in this, in this country. And that's probably true, we do. But much like you wouldn't put all your eggs in one basket, it is not prudent to rely on one source either. So diversification is applicable even in the energy sector. And that's where I think when, if you go back to your, you know, your, your, your feared high school tests where you have multiple choice questions and you know, the, the, the D was the all of the above one, that's, that's what we, we, you know, we, uh, the approach would be like you have there's a need for fossil, there's a need for, for renewables, there's a need for nuclear. And of all those, nuclear is the most abundant uh, of, of all of them. And, and you can't necessarily flip a switch and go 100% you know, in one direction. It, it's, a, it's a methodical kind of approach, and that's why we believe that uh, uh, it's important that, that we look at all of them, but right. primarily, you know, in our case, uh, nuclear, because you also can't be beholden on others for your uh, security. Because at the end of the day, Energy security equates to national security. Yeah, and, and we were having that conversation offline, but I think it's an important distinction that you make where it can't be a one-size-fits-all solution with one particular type of energy for that reason. And, and some of the goals, I mean, 2030 is pretty aggressive, 2035 or some other you know years that have been thrown out as well to get to a more clean space. 
But, you know, that also involves the roles of public-private partnerships. You just don't get a permit and it happens, right? That's a 10-year process. It's a, pro it's a process, and, and uh, at least what we've seen is the, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, understands that the legacy systems and the legacy, you know, uh, processes that existed, let's say, during the Cold War years where these, th these systems took 10 years to get online mm -hmm. is no longer competitively viable. So I think that you're seeing a more receptive audience from the regulatory side. And plus, let's face it, it's, it's something that they're not, you know, they're, 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 they're looking at it for the first time as well. It's not as if they have a blueprint here that to, to go by. So we're sort of, I hate this phrase, that I'm going to use it, I'm going to regret it. It's sort of you're building the plane while you're flying it. And yes. that's exactly what's happening here in terms of the regulatory side of things. Right, right. And there's also a public awareness campaign that needs to be had as well when you're talking about nuclear. Well, public awareness, certainly, I think that uh, it's it, both the, 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 the industry and the government have been remiss in not doing a better job in articulating and conveying and communicating repeatedly that the what we've seen, what we're experiencing now is a departure from the legacy systems that are in place that have, were designed and built in the 40s and 50s and 60s. So these are much safer and in our, in, in, from the microspace actually, smaller, so you have uh, passive safety features, you don't have the same um, amounts of fuel, you don't require the same type of coolant. So there's a whole physics and chemistry <laughs> you know, behind this that, uh, that, that makes a strong case for why micro is that much more flexible, adaptable, and, and uh, actually you know, employable. Right, well, I mean, it all goes back to efficiency at the end of the day, but back yeah. to you know, John's point, Brian, it, the one size fits all solution, whether it's solar, electric, or wind, I mean, you have to have backup power and redundancies you in do. place. I mean, it, it, it would be naive to think otherwise. Right. right. There's uh, Renewable energy is great. I, I, I love it, right? You can make electricity via the sun or via the, by the wind, um, but it doesn't always uh, a a sign shine on us. It right. doesn't always blow. And that's really where we see batteries taking a huge leap in this space, which is um, really to absorb that power during the day or when it's windy and then dispatch it when it's absolutely needed. And this is only going to continue. The, the growth in energy storage is going to be massive over the rest of this decade and then, and then further on, um, which is really exciting. And it, it isn't just backup power. It isn't just harvesting the sun when it's shining and then, you know, spitting it out when it's dark. Batteries can do some really cool things. Frequency regulation is kind of a wild, um, invisible concept, but for a utility, it's absolutely critically important for them. And so um, energy storage as a firming mechanism to renewable energies is critical. Um, and I think that we'll continue to see that be uh, a huge trend in the renewable energy. David, get into the other side of the, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, to, you know, the, the, I think the, the little missing link there in, the, in, in terms of renewables is, is just that, batteries and storage. Because if you could solve for that, you, you know, you really, really made a tremendous amount of progress. So what we think, you know, what, especially from, from a micro perspective and why, what nuclear provides in those situations where you are subjected to the vagaries of the weather, you have something that is reliable and constant. Yeah, I mean, and, and one of the, you know, the pushback that we hear a lot is it's capital intensive and these projects take a long time, but at the end of the day, it, it's gonna, more energy and operational efficiency. It is gonna drive cost savings, especially when these are available at scale and managing peak demand. I mean, at this point, how do we triage demand at this point, right? Right, right. Well, you're, 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 you're essentially time sharing, you know, basically right. like, like a computer does when it goes through its processes. That's, that, that, that's how you, you balance the load. Otherwise, you know, you can't, you, you'll, you'll, you'll be in a, you know, in a problematic situation. Right, right. I mean, I mean, you're hearing of, you know, tech companies that are driving the AI revolution, mm -hmm. buying, you know, different, you know, whether it's nuclear um, facilities or, or otherwise, right. you know, it, it makes you wonder, how do they triage when, let's say, for example, there's a brownout or, or a blackout? Where's the prioritization there? Sure. So it really, uh, those our data center customers mm -hmm. have a tough job. Our utility customers have a tough job. And what I've seen, um, really, in, in in some cases through public-private partnerships, is those two groups coming together to try to solve a problem, which is we see a need for a data center here, but there's no generation here. What are we going to do? And that really takes a lot of um, working together. There's also, you know, uh, FERC um, becomes important in, in some respects there too, if the transmission lines have to be built. Um, and we're starting to see the needle move a little bit because, you know, private industry, data center customers are willing to move a lot faster than the utility is. And sometimes that's good, right? Because they can kind of maybe get ahead of some things and maybe they can connect on the, on the back end to, to make these projects become a reality. But um, I think back to the point that we've stated before, it really is 
all of these different sources working together, but now how do we get the grid mm -hmm. to do that? Because we do have a very old infrastructure. It's great, it is a modern marvel, but it is aging and mm -hmm. it does need to be uh, upgraded. Right. And, you know. and, and to Brian's point, you, it, it serves as a forcing function for the utilities, because sometimes that's what's necessary, God bless them. Yeah. But for public-private par par uh, public partnerships, or P3s, it's, it, the term may be relatively new, but in fact, you know, little, for our history buffs out there, most of the country was built utilizing public-private partnerships. To, to, as a matter of fact, the oldest is the, Pennsylvania, is the Philadelphia Lancaster Turnpike, which dates to 1792. So Learn something new every day. Oh yeah, so that's a fact. You know, it's an interesting little little factoid out there yeah. that it's not it's not something that is a novel idea. Sure, the benefits you know derived, obviously in the modern era, are different, but the fundamental background, the, the, the core foundational you know elements date back to the founding of the republic. I mean, when you think about it, it's almost common sense now that you just now that you just said that. I mean, how else are we going to be able to execute on it? But. I also think we, we have to think of this in terms of national security and critical infrastructure. The world is a very different place than it was in, in 1792. And you know, when, when you start thinking about cyber implications, as an example, there this isn't a nice option to have. This is something that no. you know we need to move forward with. And, and it feels as if, John, the conversation has shifted from clean tech and, and, and renewable energies and the energy transition to more of a demand type of conversation, being able to meet that which I think is a little bit more digestible than putting it in that climate bucket. I, I, I agree with you. I think so it is. Uh, and I think it's more realistic uh, right. you know, in many respects. And, and I think that, that when, to, you know, to Brian's point and what you were discussing earlier about all those elements, those national elements, the, you know, the public, the private, the academic. I mean, look what we did in, the, in, in less than a decade to, you know, with the Apollo program. Try replicating that today. I mean, you, you know, you wouldn't, it would take you 10 years to get a permit, all right? So that, that, that's unacceptable, quite frankly. Yeah. So when you, you know, the, the reason public-private partnerships are so attractive is because for the, from a government perspective, and I'll put my govy hat on, it mitigates risk. So the risk and responsibility also move into the private realm. And so the private, you know, sector companies derive benefit on, on the back end, you know, on the, on the ROI side. The government is naturally risk averse, and, 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 and so they should be. But when they enter into these agreements, the upside is, you know, pretty much, you know, win-win for all. It's not an easy ride because they're complex and it's contractual issues and whatnot. Right. But but overall, I think there's more benefit than there is downside. So then you are seeing progress on the policy conversation because I think you have to understand your audience too when you're trying to work with lawmakers and, and policymakers and so forth uh, to, you know, kind of get what you want out of these partnerships. Oh, I think so. I don't think there's a choice really. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly right. I mean. Uh, to me, we need to depoliticize right. forms of energy, right? Because we do need it all. And I think the economics are gonna weigh out on who the winners and losers are, um, which, you know, time will tell. But really it has to be an all of the above approach to meet the demand or else we're gonna fall behind in critical areas like data centers and we just can't afford it. Right, right. I mean, John, you have that in, in your notes as well. I mean, the tech industry needs nuclear to keep scaling and improving its tech. I mean, the administration's bit has been quite clear that you know, the U.S. will remain in its top spot as a global leader in innovation. Well, we can't afford not to. We can't. I mean, uh, you know, we, at wearing my ARPA e-hat, which is the Advanced Research Agency uh, for the Energy Department, and looking at what our competitors uh, are able to do with their, you know, domestic uh, uh, companies in terms of support, and I'm talking all manner of support, we can't. There are red lines that, that we cannot possibly cross. And uh, unfortunately, that, that many companies fall off that, that proverbial valley of death because they, they, they don't have that support that are, are provi is provided by national governments to other companies in other countries. So we need to be on top of things in a much more competitive way than not relying so much on, you know. Uh, right. But that's, that, that's the whole challenge. Everything has become such a partisan issue and, and a talking point these days, which makes it hard to, you know, advance some policy through. Well, it has, but I think that goes back a few years, and I think right, right, right. fortunately that uh, it was again trying to do the whole, you know, square peg, round hole kind of thing, and, and you right. just, you know, you should allow the market more than anything else to determine things. Yeah. So, reaching, you know, what we have uh, three and a half years until we get to that 2030 target. Are, are we close? Are are we going to be able to meet that? Oh, great question. <laughs> I, I hope so. You know. One of the things that the current administration came in saying is that we're going to, you know, make it easier to build things. One of the things that this country desperately needs to deploy really energy, any any energy source, 
uh, but renewables, of course, falls in there as well, is transmission. Um, we have to build more transmission to get more power on the grid to meet these goals. And so I see a future where we do and, and, we, and we can and we will meet our goals with a transmission corridor that's built out. But there's also a possibility that I see where we go more distributed. Um, where it's more of a distributed model where it, maybe we don't have this bulk power system. Um, instead, we have neighborhoods or communities or, um, or cities that have kind of their own resources, solar, storage, modular, nuclear, or something like that to, to power them and just kind of, you know, really, really serve that load. Because I, I think if we can't build the transmission, then we're, we're kind of forced more in that distributed space. It almost seems like from a modular perspective, it would be more safe as well. You don't have that risk of, you know, concentration risk of one, you know, um, center true. being sh shut down. That's true. You don't, you don't have a single point of failure, essentially, right. is what you're saying. And, 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 we're, and we're, we're at, we see the benefit for, for uh, inaccessible, austere locations, underserved right. communities. Right. Uh, this is essentially a, you know, a plug and play kind of device. You could put it on a plane, you could put it on a you know, rail, truck, ship, whatever, and it gets to that location and it's, it's, it's what as I described, plug and play. And so that's the benefit of it. And you have a menu of options in terms of the type of the size of the megawatt uh, reactor that you're going mm -hmm. to employ. So, so I think there's, there's a lot of benefit uh, for, uh, for those locations and you, you also you eliminate that, uh, that risk that you alluded yeah. to. Well, I think it's smart economic policy as well, right? If you get the right training in, you upskill the workforce, you get, you know, community colleges, as we were talking about before, other institutions, um, investing in R&D and working with companies that are investing in those states to, to you know, build these um, companies that are relevant to the energy transition and, and, and you know, renewable um, energy. It makes sense. Those are good salary jobs. It goes back into the economy. That's That answers your question to skilling the workforce. Absolutely. It's unfortunate that, you know, and, you know, God bless, we all, of course, we all love America, but we, we, we tend to fall into this whole trap of, the, you know, the quarterly returns, and I know we're, we're, we're right, NASDAQ, right. Yeah. but you, you need to invest, and you need to take some near-term pain for short, for long-term gain, especially when you're talking about re-educating, recalibrating, putting people to work in these new technologies that will be the future, and, and, and I think that that's, that's, a, that's a whole of government yeah. Approach. But see, that's what's so interesting. That's when we talk about with emerging technologies, don't have it for the sake of having it. Have a problem to solve. Sure. So it makes sense. Let's teach the right curriculum to properly set up the next generation. This mm -hmm. is how you avoid, um, you know, this uncertainty around employment or what your future is going to look like. We, I mean, we need the people to build these and, and manage these, you know, grids. It, it, the it, forms of energy are changing, and so we need we need a focus on that. Right. We need to make sure also that um, we have the skilled labor out there that's going to be able to install these and then maintain yeah, them long yeah. term as well because it's changing. You know, it's now no longer so much rotating machinery. It's more, you know, it's just collects stuff from the sun and goes out in DC and it's, you know, a little bit easier, but still you have to program all this and then you get into the intelligence that you now find right. in substations that are able to, you know, accept power flows in multiple directions and predict faults you know, uh, weeks in advance, um, and so all that's, you know, that that's practicality computing. matters, and I've asked automakers this, yes, the designers and the engineers and, and you know, technology is helping get, you know, from the production line to the consumer quicker, but for all intents and purposes, you need mechanics that are trained to handle electricity and, and voltage, and, you know, you're basically more data and diagnostics focused than you are traditional mechanics. Yes. Uh, electricity is dangerous, first of all. <laughs> yes. It is very, my father's really, an electrician, yeah. so is my brother. That's yeah. why I'm always asking, yes. like, have you, do yes. you have people know how to work with voltage? Mm -hmm. that's, yep. that's, one, that's one way to take that's down the <laughs> Johnny's not an electrician. <laughs> all right, guys, appreciate the insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks, and thanks for joining me from MarketSite. I'm Joe Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.